Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you because of the certainty of the fulfillment of prophetic scripture. We know that though heaven and earth, the sky, the stars, the sun, the moon, the planets may pass away, your word will never pass away. And we know that these things we're reading, they are going to be fulfilled. Make us wise, O oh Lord, to prepare for that day. So that when that rapture will take place, every one of us will be ready. Our congregations will be ready. And the people you have allowed us to touch spiritually, to preach to, to pray for, to counsel, we pray that they too will be ready in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that your grace will be abundant in every life. And even for those who might have gone astray, and those who might have left the fold, it is not your will that any should perish. I will pray that in a special way, you make them to recover themselves. And to come back to the knowledge of the truth once again in Jesus' name. You brought back the prodigal son. Do it, Lord. Teach us your word at this time. Let the word be a blessing to every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. As you know already, the Lord has been leading us through a series of studies in Matthew chapter 24. By now you remember that this whole chapter together with chapter 25 came as a result of a question that the disciples asked the Lord. And the question itself came as a result of some statements Jesus had made. And in the characteristic way of those disciples, whenever anything was not very clear to them in any statement, any direct exhortation, or any parable, or any prophetic utterance that Jesus Christ had made, the disciples were in the habit of wanting to know. You know, that's according to their calling. The Bible tells us that he called them to be disciples. And the word disciple means learner. And whenever these disciples, these learners, whenever they heard anything from the teacher, the teacher come from heaven, from their master and their lord, from the king whom they are following, whenever they heard anything not very clear, then they will ask a question so that everything will be clear to them that's the reason they ask question in matthew chapter 24 verse 3 and as they sat upon the mount of olives the disciples the learners came unto him the master the lord and the teacher privately this was not in the audience of the public the pharisees the sadducees the doubters they were not around these were the people that had committed their lives to follow the Lord and they wanted to know from him and privately they asked him saying tell us when shall these things be these things you are saying about the nation of Israel these things you are saying about Jerusalem these things you are saying about the temple when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming they knew that he came the first time but he had been talking to them that he will still come he has spoken to them at various times and he made them to understand that he will come in the glory and the power of the kingdom you see there was a time he was telling them when he said verily i say unto you there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. At other times he had referred to his coming 
and eventually even the children had been singing when he rode triumphantly into the city blessed is he that cometh in the name of the lord and he himself at the end of chapter 23 had said i say unto you ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say blessed is he that cometh therefore they knew he will be coming and of course this coming again was still reflected even when he was being tried and questions were asked and he gave the answer to the question and he showed assuredly that he will be coming again in matthew chapter 26 and in verse 64 jesus says unto him thou hast said nevertheless i say unto you hereafter ye shall see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming coming in the clouds of heaven and so there was no doubt at all that jesus will be coming again but the disciples wanted to know the time the hour by the way why were they thinking like that because there were people that felt the kingdom might immediately appear there were people that were thinking that now that the messiah had revealed himself by many infallible proofs among the nation of israel that what he did nobody had ever done the way he taught the wisdom he manifested the power he showed and the great dynamic things that he did in fact he manifested power over every realm over death over disease over demons over natural things over elements he manifested power that the people knew that this could not be an ordinary prophet that this is he because even that woman that he met by the well when he, she invited the people she said come and see and then she asked a question he said is this not the christ and some of the people too were murmuring among them and they were saying privately do our leaders know that this is the christ with the many things they did there were people that knew that this was the christ but then there was something they were thinking about they were thinking that the kingdom will immediately appear luke chapter 19 and in verse 11 and as they heard these things he added and spake a parable why did he add that parable because he was near to jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of god should immediately appear now here was the reasoning of these jewish people jesus christ had gone into the temple he had cleansed the temple he had said, do not make my father's house a den of robbers. Not only that, he had pronounced some things on the Jewish leaders. And not only that, he himself had said he will come in the cloud in, in his power. And he felt everything was made. And he felt everything was ready. And there were some looking at his ministry and looking at the manifestation of power. They were thinking the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Because of that thought, Jesus had to give them a teaching, a parable. To know that it is not immediately appearing now. There is going to be a space of time. There is going to be a period of time. And then after some events are taking place, then he will come. See the parable he gave them. He said, verse 12, Therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. You see, they thought it, it is coming now. It's going to immediately appear. And then he gave them the parable. It is like a man going to a far country and I will be going. And I'll receive that kingdom from the authority of the Father. And then I will return. It's, uh, the, it's because of such statements that the disciples said, Well, we know he is going. But we know he is going to return. But they wanted to know so as to be well prepared. Then they said, What shall be the sign of thy coming? Not only that, they even went beyond the sign of his coming. 
They wanted to know when the end will be. The end of the age. Because they knew that everything will be renovated. They knew that the new heavens and the new earth will come. They had to, if they read Isaiah, they would have seen that. If they had read Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48, they would have seen that. If they had read Hosea, they should have seen that. If they had read Joel, they would have seen that. So they knew that there will be the final consummation, the end of things. When there will be new heavens and a new earth, these old will pass away. The new will come. So they wanted to know what shall be the sign of the end of the world. And we've been studying since um, two days ago now. You've seen in the first study the signs we talked about. Just to remind you, he spoke about worldwide deception. He spoke about worldwide uh, dissension as well. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and all that. Then he spoke also about worldwide devastation. The famine, the pestilences, the earthquakes, beginning of birth pains. He also spoke about the destruction of life torture and persecution he spoke about deflection from christ because of iniquity abounding the love of many waxing cold and then the declaration of the gospel worldwide and then he went on to tell them that everything wasn't going to be smooth for the children of israel or even for this world therefore he spoke about the abomination of desolation spoken about by the prophet daniel and then he said, Whosoever reads this, let him understand. Because here is a word that demands double, prophet, double fulfillment. It had been fulfilled, I told you yesterday, in the time of Antiochus the Great, Epiphany. But then I told you that because of what Jesus said, that he was talking to these people of a future event that will still take place. And therefore we know it's of double fulfillment. And then he went on to give them some other details. In verse 21, he said, For them shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, no, no nor ever shall be. And then he gave some exhortation, challenge, and warning. Now we come to the imminence of Christ's return. We're looking at that same chapter from verse 29. All through to verse 35. From verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, not the tribulation of the past, not the tribulation that the children of Israel had already suffered, but the future one. The end time tribulation. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branches when his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily, 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 I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away the passage divides naturally to three parts number one series of supernatural events number two sign of supernatural glory number three certainty of supernatural fulfillment as we look at the lord's return we need to understand that our Lord's return will be as real 
and as historical an event as his first coming. Having said that, we need to say this, that the second coming of Christ shall be as different as possible from the first coming. Think of those two things. The second coming will be as real as the first coming. It will be as historical eventually as the first coming. Yet, that second coming shall be as different as possible from the first coming. What do we mean by that? When he came the first time, he came as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He was born in a manger, in the manger of Bethlehem, in lowliness, in humiliation. He took on him the form of a servant and was despised and rejected of men. He was betrayed into the hands of wicked men, condemned by unjust judgment, mobbed, scorched, crowned with thorns. At last, he was crucified between two thieves. But when he comes the second time, it will not be like that. He'll be coming the second time as the king of all the earth. With all royal majesty, the princes and the great men of this world will stand before his throne to receive an eternal sentence from him. Before him, every mouth shall be stopped, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He was rejected by the Jews and the world when he came the first time. At his second coming, he will be acknowledged as a king of kings by all the world. And so you see that there's going to be a difference. It's going to be as real, literal, historical as the first coming. But it's not going to come in humiliation. It's going to come in glory. Of course, as Bible students, you know there are many passages that talk about the coming of the Lord again. You are familiar with some of the passages, but let's refresh our memory together. In Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, reading from verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men, actually angels, but they appeared as men, stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, praise the Lord. It won't be a false Christ. This same Jesus. It won't be Michael, it won't be Gabriel, it won't be an angel. This same Jesus, whom which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come, that's the word again, come, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. I believe, and I know you believe, Jesus is coming again. In Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2 from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. But we're looking for something. Verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Is coming again. In First John chapter 3, reading from verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, he appeared before he came to this world before. Now he's gone to heaven, but he's coming again. He shall appear. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as, as, not as he was. As he was, he was hungry. He was tired. He was weary. Because he put on our flesh. 
But now, as he is, as he is in glory, as he is the risen glorified Lord, as he is in majesty, we shall see him as he is. You will see him. Yeah. And every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. No doubt in your mind, Christ is coming again. If you forget all these other references, you will not forget Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Just the last chapter, the last verses. Here is how the Bible closes. He who testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. And then the representative of the church, John the Beloved, he, re he responded, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus is coming again. In Matthew chapter 24, as we look at the imminence of Christ's return, remember the point where we are now? We've got to the point in our study. We've not got to the point in experience. We've not got to the point in fulfillment. But we've gone to the point in our study where the abomination of desolation has taken place and then all those other signs uh, had been recorded and we've studied them and then the great tribulation in study not in fulfillment had already taken place and then it says now after that tribulation immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened that leads me to the first point we're considering today series of supernatural events some events that are going to take place these will touch not only the earth but the heavens not only the sky not only the uh, space but it will touch the very galaxies around around the planets around the you know a universe because the king of kings the creator of the heavens and the earth is coming and every area of life and every area of creation knows about it and not because of the agitation or because of uh, how the powers of these heavens are shaking and so it says immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light you science students, you understand that if the sun will be darkened, you know the moon gets the light from the reflection of the sun. Therefore, the moon shall not give the reflected light. And then the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of heaven shall be shaken. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. When we refer to the powers of heaven being shaken, now what holds heaven together what holds all the skies and the stars and everything what holds everything together is the power of the lord in hebrews chapter one hebrews chapter one reading from verse one god who at sundry times and in diverse manner spake to spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets as in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things and by whom he made the worlds, the worlds in the plural, all that you can see, and all that naked eyes cannot see. He made the heavens, he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his power, and upholding all things by the word of his power. He is the one holding everything together right now. Scientists will talk of the laws and everything, but the real power, supernatural power, the creative and upholding power of God through Jesus Christ is what is holding everything together. But at that time, God will let go some of the restraint, some of the control, and then the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Mark tells us in a parallel passage. Mark chapter 13. In Mark chapter 13, reading from verse 24. Mark 13, 24. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. 
So you see that Mark is recording the same thing. Luke records the same thing, but he comments on what he records. He tells us the effect that will produce on men and women that may be in the world at such a time. Luke chapter 21 from verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Once again, we're asking ourselves, were these things entirely new to the New Testament people? Because I told you, the church age was a mystery, and the rapture a mystery. But concerning the second coming of Christ, and the powers of heaven being shaken, and these series of supernatural events, were they completely strange to the people of the Old Testament? No, not at all. If they read the prophecies very well, look at Isaiah. Chapter 13, Isaiah 13, reading from verse 6. How will ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. Isn't that similar to what we have read in Luke? And in verse 8, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travelleth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. And then in verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And it shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in its going forth, and the moon shall not cause a light to shine. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, the truth shall be confirmed. Isaiah had said so by the Spirit of the Lord, Jesus the embodiment and the personification of the truth also mentioned each. And the evangelists Matthew, Mark, and Luke recorded each. And here we see in the word of God, it will show you then that the repetition of these things show you that it is affirmed, it is confirmed, it is going to happen. And then in verse 11, and I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold. That more precious there means rare. It will be difficult to find men just walking about freely because of all these things, the calamities that will be coming at that time. Even a man than the golden wedge of offer. Therefore, will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts, in the day of his fierce anger. So you will see that these are series of events that will be taking place when the coming of the Lord is just to come. That is, we're not talking of the rapture, we're talking of the second coming. There are seven things we would have noticed as we have read all those references. Let me just summarize that section for you. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the whole universe will begin to disintegrate with great rapidity. Number one, the sun will be darkened. Number two, the moon will not give light. Number three, the stars will fall from heaven. Number four, the powers of heaven, of the heavens shall be shaken. Number five, the sea and the waves will roar. Number six, there will be distress of nations upon the earth with perplexity. Number seven, men's hearts will fail them for fear. The events will be so calamitous 
that men will faint from absolute terror. Many will just die of fright. No hurricane, tornado, or tidal wave, or earthquake, or volcanic eruption, or any combination of those natural disasters in history will have approached the extreme disruption of those end time days. A scientist has tried to capture these things like this, and I'm quoting a scientist now. This is a scientist that has studied all the constellations and the stars and the position of the earth and the, pla the planets, all the planets. And if there is any shaking, any disturbance of any of the stars or the planets, it tells us these will be the consequences upon the earth in which we live. These scientists, it tells us, referring to the phenomena related to the earth in which we live, it says, if, for example, a heavenly body was loose in space and if it happened to pass close to the earth and just caused the earth to tilt a fraction of a degree on its axis here is what will happen that is a saying just a single heavenly body just a single star you see the stars so very small but actually they are very very big it's because of the distance that they appear very small it's saying that if any of those uh, stars that are in their orbits and space right now if they happen to fall and they pass by our planet earth and it makes the earth to shake to tilt a little just a fraction on its axis here is what will happen at that very moment, an earthquake will make the earth to shudder. Air and water will continue to move through an airship. Hurricanes will sweep the earth and the seas will rush over the continents carrying gravel and sand and marine animals and causing them and casting them on the land. Not only that, heat will be developed. Rocks will melt. Volcanoes will erupt. Labor will flow from fissures in the ruptured ground and cover vast area. Mountains will spring up from the plains and will travel and climb on the shoulders of other mountains causing falls and reefs. Lakes will be tilted and empty, um, empty their rivers and then the river beds will be changed. Large land areas will, will, uh, with their inhabitants will sleep under the sea. Forests will burn. Hurricane will and wild seas will wrest them from the ground from which they grew and pile them branch and root in huge heaps. The seas will turn into desert. Their water flowing away. He says it's inconceivable. Just a single body falling like that and passing near the earth. He said all these things will happen. And Jesus is telling us that immediately after the tribulation of those days, it's not just that a single heavenly body will pass around here and disrupt the movement of the earth. He's telling us that the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give a light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. I pray you will not be here at that time. You know, it's good as people of the church, the children of God, to know that in the end time, calamities are coming in, in on this world and you want to be ready so that by the grace of god you wouldn't be here to see all this you'll be with the king of kings you'll be with the lord of lords and when he's coming back with thousands of his saints i believe and i pray that you will be among the people that will come with him in jesus name let's go to point number two sign of supernatural glory sign of supernatural glory in matthew chapter 24 and now we're reading from verse 30 and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory now, I want you to realize that before this time, a lot of things will have happened. You know, sometimes uh, we believers, even though we might be evangelical or Pentecostal, sometimes we read a verse like this, but we forget a lot of other things that have happened. 
Verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Remember that means all the tribes of the earth that are still remaining. Because we shouldn't forget verses 4 to 28. You shouldn't forget the famine that has killed so many. You shouldn't forget the pestilences that were taking place before this time. You shouldn't forget the earthquakes that would have happened a long time before this time. You shouldn't forget the persecution and they surrendering the people just to be killed because of the hatred against them. You shouldn't forget that the abomination of desolation would have happened. And shouldn't forget, I read to you yesterday in Zechariah chapter 13, where it says, Two thoughts of the children of Israel would have perished, and the third will be taken through refining by fire. And now it says, of the tribes remaining, of all the people remaining at this time when the Lord is now just to come, to appear in the sky, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great with a great sound of a trumpet. If you knew anything of the children of Israel, their history, whenever they wanted to gather together in a great convocation, they were invited by the sound of the trumpet. And the Lord is referring to that uh, same thing here. He says that's exactly what is going to happen. That now it will not be the priest or the high priest blowing the trumpet, it's angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his select from the four winds, that is, from the four corners of the earth, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, it may be that there will be some scientifically inclined person there that will say, how did Jesus say the four winds? Can we actually count? Well, don't you know that in our world we'll talk of north, south, east, and west? That's what he's referring to. And when we say from this corner, from that corner, from the four winds of the earth, that is from all over the places. And so he tells us that this is exactly what will happen. The Son of Man appearing in the glory and appearing coming with clouds. In Matthew chapter 26, we saw it before, let's look at it again. Matthew chapter 26 verse 64. Jesus says unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, let me tell you something here. Uh, when you study prophecy, you have to really be very, very vigilant. Because you see, there are people that will take some small words in the prophetic utterances of Jesus Christ. And uh, then they will say, because Jesus used the word you, or ye, that he must have been speaking to the people directly in front of him. In fact, do you know, there are people that interpret Matthew chapter 24 in that way. They, say, they count all the yous and the yees in Matthew chapter 24. And then they will answer, his, they, will, they will ask a simple question. They will say, who asked the question? Then you will say, the disciples asked the question. And how did Jesus reply? Jesus replied by making use of the words you and ye. And then they will bring their conclusion from there. They will say, that means that all these things that we are reading about are taking place already in the lifetime of the disciples. But no, it's because they do not understand how the prophetic writings are normally written. You see, the, the Lord will allow the prophet to be transported or translated into the generation that is writing about. It's like the prophet is no more in this generation, is transferred, is transported onto another generation. And then he stands in that future, he stands in that, uh, in that generation, and he addresses the people as if he was part of the generation. Don't you remember Isaiah? Unto us a child is born. He died before Jesus was born. Unto us, a son is given. He died before Jesus went to the cross of Calvary. But he spoke as if he was part of that generation. Because the Lord allowed the prophet 
to be transferred or translated into the generation he's writing about. And then standing in that generation, he says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And so you understand here, when Jesus said, you or ye, he wasn't actually referring to the disciples. He was referring to the generation that will be alive at that time. You see this in this verse 64 I read to you now. Who asked the question? Look at verse 63. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter, that hereafter is not only two years, it's not ten years, hereafter is not AD, AD 70, hereafter is referring to the time when Christ will come again. But look at what he said, hereafter shall ye see. He's gone beyond the high priest now. He's transferred himself to the generation of the time of his coming. And is now seeing the generation at that time, they will see. Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. The man that was there receiving the prophecy first hand, that man is dead long ago and forgotten. And a thing has not happened yet. It's something still for the future. And when you study prophecy, those are some of the things you need to notice. And you ask yourself, what generation is this talking about? When will this take place? When this son of man will appear in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 13 and 14. Daniel 7, 13. And I saw in the night visions... And behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Isn't that how Christ himself described his coming? He'll come in power, he'll come in great glory, he'll come with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. And all the people and all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom which shall, which shall not be destroyed. I believe and I know you believe it will be so. Our Lord will come. And when he comes the Bible tells us. All the tribes, they will see him and they will mourn. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, everybody said, Amen. Amen. It's going to be so. You know, it's, it's wonderful to be a believer and to see a preview of coming events and to know that when it's coming, you will not be on the earth mourning and trembling. You would have been in the marriage supper of the Lamb after the rapture. And then he will serve you. And while coming back with thousands of his saints, it is wonderful to think of it that you will be among the saints coming with him. And when he begins to reign, you will reign with him also according to the revelation of scripture. It's wonderful that now we can stand and we can remain with the Lord. And when he will come, by the grace of God, we will reign with him in Jesus' name. Now we go to point number three, which is the certainty of supernatural fulfillment. Certainty of supernatural fulfillment. After Jesus had said all these things, he wanted to show them that these things are certain. I want to bring you back now as we talk about fulfillment. I want you to know that the prophecies you read in scripture, there are times that these prophecies will look incredible, unbelievable, that if you were to think about it, you will say, how will that be possible? That's always um, an element in prophecy. 
And as we look at some uh, prophecies that are already fulfilled now, that we know they have already been fulfilled in the past. As we look at them, at the time they were given, the prophets who gave them, they must have been wondering, how will that be fulfilled? Take, for example, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. And I shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah could have been wondering if he forgot the unlimited power of God. If he forgot the greatness of God. He could have been wondering how will it ever be possible, although it appeared incredible, unbelievable, yet it happened. As you think about the temple that Jesus Christ had just spoken about, a massive kind of structure. When Jesus was telling them, See ye not all this, not one stone will be left upon the other. For the disciples that Jesus was talking to, to them, that would have looked incredible, impossible. But once again, remember, it happened exactly like that. And as we're looking at these prophecies now that are yet to be fulfilled, when he's telling us that the sun shall be darkened, Maybe you have never seen even ordinary eclipse of the sun. And you're wondering, how will that be possible? And he's saying that the moon shall be darkened, or shall not give its light. And that the stars will fall, and a part of the heaven shall be shaken. And all these other things that he had been speaking about, you might, you might have been wondering, how could this ever happen? Because he knew there might be people like that. That's why he now gives us verses 32 to 35. Telling us of the certainty of supernatural fulfillment. From verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender. And put it forth leaves. Ye know that summer is near. Let me remind you again. There are times that. People complicate the word of God. Uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's funny as well as pathetic. That there are people that will, you know, go into a particular study room and then they'll be propounding theories upon theories upon these things. And I'm telling you that if Peter were to take uh, the books of commentaries and theologies today and read the comments they are passing on the first epistle of Peter. Even Peter, the fisherman, will not understand the language. And he was the one that gave the word. I'm telling you that if today Mark was to come back here and he was to get into the libraries of the seminaries of the world and pick up the commentaries they have written about the gospel according to St. Mark, uh, Mark will read that and say, I don't understand this. I'm the one that wrote the gospel according to St. Mark. All your comments and all the things you are saying, they're too deep for me. They're too great for me. I cannot understand. You see, there are people that complicate interpretation of the Bible. They forget the audience that Jesus spoke to originally. Now, let's remind ourselves that Jesus was speaking to people that did not have doctorate degrees, People that had not studied very, very deeply. These were just rural people. Peter, James, John, Andrew, and all these people, and Matthew, they were simple folks. They were not the people that the New Testament even referred to as the doctors of the law. These were simple people like you and me. And Jesus had told them all this. And then he came up with this statement in verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. Oh, Peter says, we saw a fig tree on the other, the other time. All of them had seen fig trees before. This wasn't something complicated. He said, when you see a fig tree, you who developed in the village in rural areas, among the farmers and the fishermen, when the branch is yet tender, and then it puts on leaves, what do you say? You say, because you know that summer is near. You can tell, because of the things happening to this fig tree, that this is about to come to pass. Then in verse 33, he said, in the same way, very simple comment. This is not something so profound, you cannot understand. He said, so likewise, when you, you, when you see all these things, what are all these things? 
there are many people that will leave Matthew chapter 24 and travel all over a uh, other uh, kind of information and other materials to tell us when you see these things. But let's come back. When you see these things, what things? Deception, dissension, devastation, and the, all these things, the destruction of life and the desolation of abomination. And all the things that he has spoken about. And then when you see all the calamities and everything that I've already told you. When you see these things, you know that it is near even at the door. Then he said, verily I say unto you, this generation. What generation? Once again, remember. It's not talking of the generation of the apostles because they're all dead now. And they didn't see all this. He said, when you see all these things, the ye there, the you there, is referring to the people that will be alive at the time when those things will be taking place. When you see those things happening, you know that that generation that sees all that will not pass till every other thing be fulfilled. It's telling us, look at what you see today. Don't you see much today? I said, don't you see much today? All these things that we have been reading, are they strange to you at all? No, not at all. And the Lord is saying, when you see all these things coming in rapid succession, not just happening there far apart, but it's happening here and there and there and there in rapid succession. When you see these things in such rapidity, taking place like it never took place before, that generation should know that the generation seeing all these things coming to pass will not pass away until everything be fulfilled. If the second coming is near, and the rapture should take place, must take place before the second coming. If the second coming is near, the rapture is much much nearer. There's no time to waste. There's no time to play religion. There's no time to be hypocritical. There is no time to live in secret sin. Because the generation that sees all these things happening, that generation will see the rest of the things happening. That's why the exhortation of scripture to you and to me is that we will get ready. And I pray every one of us will be ready. Then he said... Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all this is be fulfilled. Then he said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. These words we have been studying together, these words we have been reading together, they are sure, they are certain, they will not pass away. If that is so, what's the conclusion? What will be your attitude and my attitude? How are we to be preparing? Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 from verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That means suddenly, unannounced, unprepared for, sometimes unnoticed. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burnt up. Now it's easy for you and for me to read all these verses, and just read them, because after all, you are familiar with them. I wouldn't be the first person to quote this passage to you, Maybe you have even quoted it yourself. But let's think about it. It says that day will be coming. And it is very, very near. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Then it says, and the earth also. And the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Now, do you realize, even in this our uh, church, deeper life, it appears that many of our pastors and many of our overseers and many of our leaders were shifting uh, to wanting, we want, uh, you know, this wonderful building here, wonderful building here. Right now, in many of our churches, it is easier to collect hundreds of thousands of your currency together to build building. You cannot provide hundred or one thousand of your currency to print tracts. 
Your emphasis is on the building, not on the church. Your emphasis is on the material things and the things we can see so that all those people in the world, they will see a magnificent building, a wonderful building, and once that building is there, then we have, in fact, there may even be people that are contemplating on having an air-conditioned church auditorium. My friend, everything is going to be burnt away. The souls were called upon to win. You see, the early church they didn't have all those mighty, gigantic buildings. But they met on the shore, they met on the street, they met in the upper room, they met in the house of Priscilla and Aquila, they met in the palace, they met everywhere just to make sure that souls have been won, people have been disciples, and people are coming to the Lord. If you get to the uh, situation in your church location, if you get to this situation in your region, in your state, in your nation, where all the money that is available, you are putting it on property for your personal use, for the use of the church, or for the use of whatever. If that is the concentration, no more printing of tracts, no more distribution of cassettes, no more sponsoring the people that ought to go out and reach out because the money we should have spent in telling them to go to that rural place, go to that village, and go to that area, preach the gospel, we want to spend on building. And he tells us, everything shall melt away with fervent heat. The earth and the works that are therein shall be burnt up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, were looking for new heavens and a new earth. Are you looking for that? Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blemish. May the Lord make us ready. And may the Lord use us to make the people who are listening to us in our various nations and states and regions, may God use us that they too will be ready as we are preaching to them in Jesus' name. Things are coming in this world that just hearing or seeing will make a person to be so frightened that his heart will stop functioning, he'll just give up. I pray that you wouldn't be here at that time. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, make me ready. Make me ready. Our children, you have given us this song, I'll fly away. The day of rapture, I'll fly away. Lord, do, Lord, do, Lord, remember me. Are you telling the Lord to remember you? If you are backsliding, are you telling the Lord to remember and restore you? If you are concentrating on amassing wealth, acquiring buildings and property, no more printing of tracts, no more evangelization, no more spending money on the spiritual side. Are there not people here? You can't even sponsor your people to come to the Congress, but you can spend your money to provide a VIP kind of IFL program only to feed those sinners. But your people that are preaching the gospel you cannot spend the church money and, and sponsor them and bring them here. Or you are reserving the money for church building. Yes, we have the money. But we are reserving it for church building, church property. We cannot spend the money to bring them here for training. To bring them to be exposed to the word of God. We cannot spend the money to give them Christian book. Christian literature, or cases. We cannot spend the money to develop their lives. We only have the money for property, the things that will be melted away. We need to repent of that attitude.
Don't let us put all our efforts in building auditoriums and mansions and cathedrals. Spend the money to evangelize. Spend the money to bring people into the kingdom. Spend the money to send out missionaries. Spend the money to prepare programs that will get people saved. Concentrate on holiness. Teach the people. Let our emphasis remain on developing the people, helping the people, leading them to the Lord. We will not take buildings to heaven. We will not take the properties to heaven. The people that will be raptured are the members. Not the building. Concentrate on the people. Teach the people. Develop the people. Sponsor them to come to a congress like this. Spend more time with your workers. Rather than looking for money to build this and build that. Develop people, not property. And you yourself, develop your spiritual life. Develop your spiritual life. That's the thing that counts. The Lord is coming again. Are you getting ready?